Eric, could you talk a little bit about how race factored into the Door Rebellion? Um, race played a very significant role uh, in the Door Rebellion. Unfortunately, in, in broader narrative uh, accounts of the antebellum period that have been uh, written in the last 10 years or so that have mentioned the Door Rebellion, uh, the issue of race has been uh, left out of these accounts. But when you look closely at the summer and the early part of the fall of 1841 and the run-up to the People's Convention uh, in Providence, uh, race played a major role. Um, African Americans, um, primarily living in the city of Providence, um, gravitated towards the Rhode Island Suffrage Association. Um, uh, black Rhode Islanders have been disenfranchised since 1822 and the rhetoric coming out of the Rhode Island Suffrage Association about the rights of the people, the people's sovereignty, the right to vote, um, uh, rights of citizens, uh, all Americans as citizens, uh, th this was language that very much um, black Rhode Islanders keyed into and wanted to become uh, connected with this organization. And early on, they did play a role in a lot of the uh, functions that the Rhode Island Suffra Suffrage Association put on in the, in the spring of 41 and the summer of 41. But as you get into August, uh, when it comes time to vote for delegates to the People's Convention, um, uh, blacks in Providence are prevented from going to the voting uh, booths and, and casting uh, a ballot for uh, delegates. And immediately, um, black Rhode Island has become concerned that the Suffrage Association um, and the delegates who were finally selected to this People's Convention, which is going to take place in the fall, were going to include a white-only clause in their constitution, that they were going to um, take the very broad rhetoric of the people's sovereignty and the rights of the people and make it for white people only. Um, also, um, really in what we would call today race baiting, a series of articles started to appear in the Providence Journal under the pseudonym named Town Born. Uh, historians believe it to be actually Samuel Ames as the author of these articles, and uh, Ames also happened to be Thomas Wilson Dorr's uh, brother-in-law. And Samuel Ames, who had very little concern uh, for the black community in Rhode Island, but what he wanted to do was really to rev up the tensions and to put um, the black community and the Suffrage Association and abolitionists in Rhode Island at odds and to really start a fight. Uh, and he was very good at doing that in these very sarcastic and incendiary uh, articles that he wrote in the Providence Journal under the pseudonym Town Born. Uh, when the People's Convention does uh, begin, it is quite clear that most of the delegates are leaning towards a white-only clause. Uh, in the middle of the convention, uh, a very moving, articulate, elegant petition comes to the convention floor and is handed to, uh, to Thomas Dorr. Um, by a young black minister named Alexander Crummel, who uh, later would go on to become one of the foremost black intellectuals in the 19th uh, century. Um, Crummel uh, brought this petition on behalf of several uh, blacks living uh, in the city of Providence, including a man named Ichabod uh, Northup. And in this petition, um, Providence uh, Providence's black community really talks eloquently about um, citizenship and in terms really that we wouldn't see uh, again until uh, we have a serious debate over citizenship um, and during what we call radical reconstruction and the debate over the 14th Amendment. They're really talking about the issue of a colorblind democracy and what citizenship means and why they deserve to be a part of this new constitution that's being drafted in this convention. Uh, and they uh, warn the convention that they're going to be uh, potentially labeled as hypocrites for putting a white-only clause into the document. Unfortunately for the black community, um, at the end of the day, a white-only clause is inserted into the People's Constitution. Thomas Dorr, the abolitionist Dorr, fought very, very hard against this but lost. Um, the black community, for all the right reasons, looked to Dorr as an ally in the convention. This was a man who received endorsements when he ran for Congress in 1837 and 1839 from William Lloyd Garrison's The Liberator, from Nathan Rogers' The Herald of Freedom, probably the two most prominent abolitionist newspapers in the country. He was a member of the Rhode Island Anti-Slavery Society. He sat on the executive committee of that society. 
Dorr attended um, multiple conventions in New York City for the American Anti-Slavery Society. He was a well-known commodity within New England abolitionist circles. Uh, they very much thought they had an ally in Dorr, and they did. He worked hard for their cause. He did believe that uh, they deserved the right to vote, um, that labeling the people's sovereignty for white people only was indeed hypocritical, um, and against the Declaration of Independence and the ideology that really was the underpinning of the Rhode Island Suffrage Association. End of the day, though, Dorr loses, but he does achieve two significant victories, I think, within the convention, despite all the opposition to black voting um, that uh, is going on uh, in the People's Convention. The first thing that Dorr is able to achieve is a provision in the People's Constitution that provides jury trials for fugitive slaves. Uh, the later part of the 1830s, as you get into the 1840s, the fugitive slave issue in the United States is becoming a major constitutional and political issue. Um, Many states, many northern states, that is, had adopted what they call personal liberty laws. Dorr, a trained attorney and a known abolitionist, no surprise that he pushed to provide for some uh, basic legal protections for suspected fugitives. So they, certainly people who were not indeed fugitives would not be uh, wrongfully accused and uh, sent into slavery in the South. Um, the second thing that Dorr was able to achieve, and this came out at the 11th hour in the People's Convention, is he got a clause into the document that mandated that the white-only clause would have to be revisited, that in the first election after the formation of the people's government, the issue would go out to the voters uh, as a referendum, um, and it, it would vote it up or down. And that was mandatory. There was no way to get around it. It was built right into the documents. So the General Assembly, the new General Assembly under the People's Constitution, would have to do this. And Dorr looked at this clause, and he knew it, it was really the best that he could do. And he hoped that New England abolitionists would see that, that he worked uh, hard for their cause. He did indeed fail, but he managed to salvage a little bit. And in a year or two down the line, he could perhaps um, eliminate that notorious white-only clause. Unfortunately, though, the New England abolitionist movement was not interested in waiting. Uh, they believed that what had happened in the People's Convention uh, was uh, so, so wrong that it, needed, that it needed an immediate response. And who shows up in Rhode Island to protest this document? Abby Kelly. Um, from Millbury, Mass, um, just north, uh, up what is now Route 146 from Providence, going towards Worcester. A very young Frederick Douglass comes to protest against the People's Constitution. Abby Kelly's future husband, Stephen Foster, uh, from New Hampshire, along with another man named Parker Pillsbury, another prominent abolitionist from New Hampshire. They all travel to Rhode Island and participate in six anti-slavery conventions that are held throughout the state. And uh, these conventions are designed to protest against the People's Constitution, to speak out, to say what had gone wrong in the People's Convention, that these delegates had taken very lofty ideals and had trampled upon them. Um, Fortunately for these abolitionists, as, as hard as they worked, and they, some of them risked their own lives in the winter of 1841, as you get into the early part of 1842, Abby Kelly had an ice ball thrown at her head. Uh, Frederick Douglass, in, some, in one of his later uh, memoirs that, uh, that he wrote in the 1890s, talked about riding in the Jim Crow car in the freezing cold. Um, so to, for considerable risk to their own personal safety, um, they, abolitionists came to Rhode Island, but it was all for naught. The People's Constitution was overwhelmingly adopted in late December 1841 um, by nearly 14,000 Rhode Islanders with only about 50 against. Um, so the majority of the population, that is the white population um, of the state, um, certainly did not uh, listen at all to what the abolitionists had to say. Uh, but as 
you get into 1842, the issue of race uh, still continues to play a major role in the rebellion. Uh, as the springtime, as you get into April and May, especially when Thomas Dorr journeys to Washington, D.C., after he's um, inaugurated as the people's governor um, and has his parade through the streets of Providence, and he goes to Washington to meet with President John Tyler. Dorr really gets a lesson in uh, sectional politics, and he gets a lesson um, also in the role of race in America at that point in time. White Southerners um, had this somewhat irrational fear that Dorr was going to spread his doctrine of the right of the people to alter or abolish their form of government all across the country. And by doing so, Dorr was going to incite slave revolts. So in this sense, Dorr came across as uh, a white Nat Turner. Uh, this was, of course, absurd. Dorr had no intention whatsoever of, of leading uh, a slave revolt. He was not a John Brown. Um, but the white South, uh, especially a lot of Southern politicians, uh, including John Calhoun and William Preston of South Carolina, painted Dorr as a dangerous demagogue who was um, going to do just that. They reminded John Tyler of Dorr's time um, in the Rhode Island Anti-Slavery Society, his role uh, on certain committees with the American Anti-Slavery Society in the, in the annual meetings in New York. Um, and this wasn't that long ago. This was just in the later part of the 1830s. And all of Dorr's uh, activities as an abolitionist got brought back up again and connected with this current movement um, to uh, revise Rhode Island's archaic governing structure, but in the hands of a very skillful um, politician like William Preston from South Carolina, as I said, or John Calhoun, Dorr came across as a demagogue uh, and as a dangerous abolitionist, as a radical. Uh, and they were able to get to John Tyler and really paint Dorr as someone that he needed to stay away from. And, and John Tyler wanted nothing to do with Dorr. He didn't come out to aid Dorr at all. Um, other major Democratic uh, politicians at this point, Democratic senators such as Levi Woodbury from New Hampshire, Silas Wright from New York, um, in private expressed um, uh, their uh, affinity for what Dorr was doing. Um, but in public, they would never come out and support him. Both Woodbury and Wright were looking to get the Democratic par Party nomination, potentially, in 1844. And supporting Thomas Dorr would ruin them, certainly in the minds of the White South. And so uh, that was simply not an option for, for them to support Dorr uh, openly. Um, and so as May rolls into June, um, the issue of race still continues to play a role. Um, black Rhode Islanders are so uh, angry at being shut out of the People's Convention, at being shut out literally of the People's Constitution, that they decide that they are going to support the law and order side, that they are going to support the charter authorities. Um, and they did this in exchange in the hopes that in the fall of 1842, when a new convention would finally be called by the Rhode Island General Assembly, that they would indeed get the right to vote. Uh, and that is exactly what happened. There was a referendum on, on, on whether or not to allow blacks into the body politic in Rhode Island in the fall of 1842. And uh, they do um, gain back, I should say, the right to vote. And this becomes the first time and only time in the antebellum period where um, Blacks who had previously had the right to vote and had it taken away had regained it. Um, so as a direct result, really, of Thomas Dorr's actions and the rebellion itself, Black Rhode Islanders, in a very roundabout way, do achieve what they had wanted all along, and that is the right to vote, though it came from a group of people um, that they did not initially turn to for support. Uh, initially, once again, they were turning towards the Suffrage Association and Thomas Dorr, uh, who were talking eloquently about the rights of the people. 
uh, and what that meant.